uh, I didn't bring a water bottle. I didn't want a career-ending sip to happen tonight. I knew I was going to be on camera. Um, Rob's going to pass out a couple of things for me. Uh, I, 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 I take a look at it. The, well, we'll talk about them after you guys get them, but just to kind of tell you a little bit about uh, who I am and. Thank you all for, for having me, and, and I sincerely thank you all for being here tonight. And I, I really mean that. I know we all have, uh, you know, we all wish that, you know, government worked and the debt wasn't out of control and all these problems weren't happening because we all have, you know, friends and family and loved ones and hobbies we'd much rather be spending time on. But, you know, the work you guys are doing here tonight and that you guys do here at, at all your meetings is extremely important. I sincerely thank you for doing it, and believe me, I understand. Um, so he gave a little introduction. Um, if I were in your shoes, the first thing I'd want to know is, you know, who's this guy? So I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my story and how I got active. In 2007, I was newly married, and uh, my wife and I went out camping into the desert with uh, another couple. And uh, I'll, I'll keep it real brief. I was actually harassed by a Bureau of Land Management uh, agent over a perfectly legal shotgun that, that I had. We were out camping and shooting and that sort of thing. And, and I determined by telling him what the law was that he didn't know the law that he was trying to enforce. And he kind of said, well, if it's not stolen, I'm going to take it and uh, I'm going to run the numbers and if it's not stolen, I'll give it back to you. Now I knew it wasn't stolen because it was mine, I bought it, so I was very respectful and, and said thank you and I, I talked to him a little bit more after and found out that he was actually a gun enthusiast and I thought, you know, <laughs> Here's a guy who's supposed to, you know, be on our side. He knows the problems, and he's complaining about the California laws and everything. And, you know, for a paycheck, he's he's more than willing to just throw all that away and, you know, harass a guy and his wife out camping. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people would really understand this, but, um, you know, I sat down after he left, and like I said, we were very respectful and and cooperative with him. And I sat down, and I, I just. I got really upset. I, I just really kind of bummed. Like I just sat there and it was real quiet and kind of thought about it for a while. And I thought, you know, what if I was out here trying to, you know, I was running a, a religious ceremony and they came out and said, no, 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 can't do that. Or if I came, you know, I was had a printing press and was producing pamphlets for, you know, some criticizing the government. And they came out and said, hey, is, is that printing press registered? You know, and people would be up in arms. But there was something about the fact that it was, you know, there were firearms that people were kind of like, well, you know, he probably shouldn't have been out there anyway with a gun and just camping him. So I decided right then and there, I'm going to change, um, you know, the low information voter out there. I'm going to change, I want to change their perception of firearms. You know, I've been sitting on the sidelines, my own little world, I want to do something. The next month, I went to my first NRA meeting. The month after that, I was elected vice president. And, <laughs> and we, j I just, we just took off. I started doing uh, all kinds of, of uh, volunteer activity. And it is all volunteer activity. By day, I work for a bank in their 401k department. Everything I do, I'm not, I don't represent the NRA. I don't represent any organization. I'm not, you know, I don't get paid for you know, all the volunteer work. And I'm sure all of you can understand that. And I really appreciate it. Um, does everybody have what uh, Rob was passing out? He's getting there? Okay, well, while he's uh, finishing up with the last couple people, um, I'll just tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, talk about the actual Second Amendment and the words in, you know, the 27 words that make up the, the Second Amendment. So I'm going to kind of start at 30,000 feet, and then we're going to kind of come in and, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to talk about the Second Amendment. We're going to talk about California laws, and then we're going to talk about, well, what do we do now? And uh, hopefully the, the lady will keep me in line here with time. But uh, in, <laughs> in the notes, what I have is it's actually uh, some blanks here. And it's going to go along with what I'm talking about. And it, you have pens on your, on your table there. And I, I really invite you to fill in some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Because I really wanted it to be useful and something you could take with you and something that could be interactive. And, and I, you know, I want to give you what I call uh, uh, arrows for your quiver. I want you to walk out of here with useful information that you can put into practice, you know, something that you can actually use day to day. So who can, does anybody have the Second Amendment memorized? Can everybody recite it? <laughs> Nobody? You know, sometimes when I'm put on the spot, I have to kind of go, uh. It's a well-regulated militia being necessary. Here you go. 
Well, I don't know at all. <laughs> Being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So let's talk a little bit about those words. A well-regulated militia. Let's talk about the term well-regulated. And I actually got into an argument with a guy. Um, he, oh, shoot, what was his name? He was running for uh, Congress, and then he ran for governor here in California. He was on an AM station. I called in, and, and he said, well, well, it says well-regulated. And he, he, by the way, was a, uh, a, a professor at Stanford. He was a, a law professor at Stanford. And he said, well, well-regulated. That means we've got to have a lot of laws. And no, that's not what it means. That's literally not what it means from a historic perspective. It's not what it means from a legal perspective. Well-regulated, at the time when they wrote it, meant competent. It meant uh, trained. Um, they, I, I have a feeling if they wrote it today, they probably would have said well-trained. Well-regulated um, was actually a term for uh, uh, surveying equipment that meant that it was accurate and you know, precise, that sort of thing. So if you know, right in, the, in your little blank there, well-regulated equals right in there, well-trained, competent. So a well-regulated militia, okay, militia. Militia means, meant then what it means now. Militia are citizens fighting as a military organization. Um, and it, it, it's, it's quite that simple. Um, there's a lot of argument over, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, do you only have that right as a militia? You know, now that we have a National Guard, does that take the Second Amendment away because they're our militia? It doesn't say as a militia you have the right to keep and bear arms. It says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. Um, necessary. So after militia, I'll just put, you know, civilians serving in a military capacity. Um, necessary. Necessary, believe it or not, meant then what it means now. They didn't say it was optional. They didn't say it was a good idea. They said if you don't have a well-regulated militia, you don't have a free state. So if you take that away, you know, it's, it's necessary to, for the security of a free state. So necessary meant absolute. You, you absolutely need this, by definition, to have a you know, secure free state. Um, you have to have a well-regulated militia. So necessary means now what it means then. Keep and bear. A, a lot of people uh, kind of forget that they're, they're actually talking about two different rights there. Keep and bear. To keep and bear arms. Keep meaning own, and by all means fill that in. Bear meaning on you. It means you know, bearing arms. Actually carrying it. So, um, in 2008, when they talked, when they, when the Supreme Court had Heller versus D.C. decision, which actually came down that, you know, it is a uh, an individual right. Which, by the way, it was a five to four vote. But one thing that a lot of people don't know, without reading the dissenting decisions, is that all nine justices, um, even though four of them didn't agree with the the five majority, all nine of them said, yeah, it's an absolute, you know, individual right to keep and bear arms. It's an individual right. Um, five of them just said that, you know, hey, you can't regulate it the way Washington, D.C. is regulating it. And the four said, well, yeah, you can. It's an individual right, but you can regulate the heck out of it. So all nine of them, though, agreed it's an individual right, which blew away 30 years of anti-gun propaganda. They are all kind of leaning on the whole, well, it's, it's the right of the state. It's a collective right. The, you know, we don't have that anymore. It's not an individual right, which didn't make any sense at all. But it is two rights, keep and bear arms. So, uh, so, so how to talk? So that's 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 the 27, you know. Uh, I didn't define all of them. The rest of them are self-explanatory. But those are the important parts of the Second Amendment that a lot of people don't don't know about. You know, uh, the, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So they don't have to be serving in a militia. They don't have to be uh, in the form of a militia. It's it's in order to have a competent, well-regulated militia. You need to basically, you know, civilians need to have access to arms. They need to be able to keep and bear arms. And that brings me to how to talk about the Second Amendment t today. And I know I'm kind of guilty of this, and uh, some other people are, I I've, I've seen in, you know, chat rooms and discussions, that sort of thing. When people ask, you know, well, gee, the Second Amendment, they were talking about, uh, you know, that was, that was 1790. That was a long time ago. Um, you know, I don't really know if we need that. You know, you're talking to somebody at work, you're talking to somebody on the bus, you're talking, you know, it's just, I don't know, you know, you're talking about assault weapons, that sounds scary, I don't like that idea. Is this something we really need anymore? And, 
you know, what's the purpose of it? Can't we just kind of, you know, tweak it a little bit and regulate it and everything? And the first thing you think of is it's for tyranny against our own government. You know, we're going to stand against our own government. And I'm not saying that's wrong. You, you know, that is absolutely one of the purposes of the Second Amendment. But when you're talking to somebody who's undecided, they're not, you know, really educated, they're not up on the topic. They're, it's not, they don't live and breathe it. They're not here tonight. You know, they're watching American Idol. There's someone that could be swayed. Um, I, I don't think the best avenue to take when you're talking about the Second Amendment is, well, the purpose is so we can shoot the government. <laughs> so my recommendation is, Go, go ahead again. Probably, they probably voted for the government. You know, and I know right now we think to ourselves, well, you know, the leadership in Sacramento, the leadership in Washington, D.C., isn't exactly somebody I'm ready to stand up for. You know, I, I, they, they totally disagree. They're screwing everything up. But the reality is, and I, and I suggest you tell them this story. You tell them, hey, look, the Second Amendment. Let's say somebody comes to your door and they have a letter. And the letter says, hey, I'm authorized by the president to, to have you come defend your country. You know, our, our, our defenses have been decimated and, and, and we need your help. You know, and ask them, wouldn't you stand up for your country? You know, at that point, you're not Republican, you're not Democrat, you're not Libertarian, you're just an American and you're standing up for your country. And they say, yeah, you know, I, sure I would. Yeah, I'd stand up for my country. And you take them one step further and you say, okay, well, you, you gotta join the militia. You gotta stand up for your country. How are you gonna do it? Well, I don't have a gun, but you know, my neighbor's got some guns. You know, maybe I'll go over and see if that guy's got some guns and then I'll be able to stand up for my country. And, and you say, all right, great. So you go over to that guy's house, that neighbor of yours. And he says, yeah, yeah, I got a couple of guns. He said, uh, I have two for you. He said, you, you can pick one. You can have yourself a six shot, two inch barrel revolver. That's about 100 years old. And you can go defend your country with that. Or, I have this new AR-15 with a 30-round detachable magazine, it's semi-automatic. Now, which one do you think, well, obviously, if you're going to serve as a militia in that capacity, you know, which one's more appropriate? Obviously, you know, a semi-automatic rifle, that sort of thing. And you explain to them, hey, look, it's a very patriotic right, the Second Amendment. It's for standing up for your country. And at the time, in 1790, this was a very real situation. You know, that, that it was very possible that they were going to have to go door to door and say, hey, get your gun, form, you know, and let's go and fight. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and you can have the debate, you know, you're, you're an intelligent person, we're intelligent people. You can have the debate on whether or not the Second Amendment is still necessary. Have that debate. But what you can't deny is what its original intent was and what it protects today. And what it protects today is uh, the right for civilians to own the type of firearm that they would use in that situation. And if you want to change that Second Amendment, go back to the Constitution and look to see if there are any instructions on how to amend the Constitution. Because the way to do it is not to gut it through state law and through you know, a presidential mandate and that sort of thing. And you know, I've tried this and I've talked to people and, and you know, it, it, it kind of makes people scratch their head and think, yeah, you know what, you're right. You know, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Maybe it is what we're protecting is, you know, AR-style scary black rifles and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, maybe I do need to look at this thing a whole other way. And, but that's, that's what I wanted to get across, um, is if we talk about this thing a little bit different, and if we talk to people that are maybe, uh, you know, the low information voters, and we get them up to speed, you know, you could possibly turn somebody into a constitutionalist overnight, you know, at the water cooler. And say, yeah, okay, I see, I get you, you know. And by the way, good luck trying to amend the Constitution to get rid of the Second Amendment. I mean, it's, you know, good luck. So, that's my suggestion on how to talk about the Second Amendment today. Um, so, California laws. This, this is huge. Um, what's going on today is, is as bad as it gets, frankly. Um, basically, the Democrat caucus in the Senate met and came out with a bunch of proposals. So, they're bills. They're going to happen. They're not like, well, gee, we might think about it. There's a list of bills that are, you know, polling. Some of them are written. Some of them aren't written yet. But there are some placeholder bills um, that they're going to they're going to come up for a vote. They're going to happen. You know, there are 25 Republicans in the Assembly out of 80. 
You know, we're, we're not going to be able to stop them. The assembly's not going to be able to stop them. This is going to happen. And if there's one thing I emphasize to you tonight, if there's one thing you walk away with, it's that. This isn't, it's not if, it's when. Some of the uh, California laws. Outlawing of hollow point defense ammunition. Outlawing possession of more than 500 rounds of ammunition. Outlawing all semi-automatic rifles with detachable magazines. And it's actually a little unclear if they're going to outlaw all semi-automatic rifles or if they're going to outlaw semi all semi-automatic guns, which would it's like 90% of you know, what people own. Um, outlaw guns with uh, magazines that hold over six bullets. And outlaw bullet buttons, which we'll talk about in a, little, in a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit more about what bullet buttons are. They're also going to legally require the registration of all guns background checks um, in order to buy any ammunition. So basically you're going to have to go through the same steps you do when you buy a gun um, when you buy ammunition. Uh, liability insurance. If you're a gun owner, you're going to be required to purchase liability insurance. Um, and criminalizing the storing of a gun in your home without a trigger lock installed. So if you have a gun on your nightstand and there's no trigger lock on it, you're a criminal. And these are real bills. They will be passed. Um, and it, there isn't much we can do about it, frankly, right now. Uh, you know, it's, it's a single party state. The Democrats are determined and they're in power. And they're not fond of guns and they're less fond of gun rights. So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what do we do? I mean, is this hopeless? Like what, you know, why are you here talking? Just to tell us how bad it is? Well, there's a couple things that I think we can do. Um, Basically, once they're passed, there are three very effective groups in California that are going to have to stand up and, and sue. They're going to have to take them to court. And the groups have all been very successful in the past, and we have a lot of uh, uh, decisions on our side you know, to help th these guys along. The three groups are uh, CalGuns Foundation. Has anybody heard of CalGuns? CalGuns is actually a website. Um, it's a uh, message board that was started by a bunch of computer guys up in Northern California. And when the first assault weapons ban went through, these guys just started a message board and started talking about it. And they've turned into a highly effective organization. Um, they've done a lot of really uh, pretty amazing things. So what do we do? Number one, join NRA. Who here is not a member of the National Rifle Association? Not a member. And that, that's, that, that's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. And we're going to have the opportunity tonight for you guys to join. Um, but the NRA, Cal Guns, and then there's one more group called the California Rifle and Pistol Association. So all you, all, who, who's a member of the NRA? Now put your hand down if, wait, 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 keep them up. Put your hand down if you are not a member of the California Rifle and Pistol Association. So you're NRA and CRPA? Awesome. Okay, California Rifle and Pistol Association is basically the state uh, affiliate that does a lot of uh, footwork and grunt work for, uh, for the NRA. They're, they're separate organizations, but they work together. And in the past, there's been a little uh, you know, give and take, but they, they work together. So number one, join the NRA. If you're a member of the NRA, join the CRPA. If you're a member of the NRA and the CRPA, donate to CalGuns. And I'm going to show you how to do all that tonight. Number two. Absolutely, write the letters, make comments on websites, call in on radio talk shows, talk to friends and neighbors, visit with politicians and write letters to the editor. Now the one thing about writing a letter is uh, it only works if that's your introduction. So if you just write a letter and think, okay, I wrote a letter and that's going to make a difference, that, you know, changing somebody's mind is a lot to ask of a letter. So I tell people, first off, Send an email, print the email, fax the email, take the fax, mail it to, mail it to them. So you're at least hitting them three times, email, fax, and, uh, and sending a letter. But then follow up, call up, hey, I sent a letter to you know, Assemblyman whoever. I sent a letter to Senator so-and-so, did they get my letter? Can I meet and talk to them about that letter? Um, so do that. Number three is if you don't currently own a firearm, now's the time. Buy a firearm and get professional training. Um, once these bans go through, it's going to be very difficult, number one. But number two, the more you know, the more effective you can be. Now, I'm getting the, uh, the high sign here, so I'm going to move on to a couple other things. I brought two books, 
And I put the information for these books there. First one's called The Founder's Second Amendment, Origins of the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. Extremely interesting book, extremely uh, uh, useful, a lot of good information. The other one's called More Guns, Less Crime. It's written by John Lott. John Lott's an economist who needed some uh, uh, crime statistics. And uh, so he put together a book um, based on, uh, uh, he, he basically found out that the more guns you have, more legally owned guns you have in society, the more crime it goes down. Now the difference between these two books, philosophical, practical, okay? A lot of people, people are going to respond to one or the other. You know, people are going to say, ah, I don't care what they, you know, 1790, I don't really care. But I do care that I'm safe in my neighborhood. You know, or they're going to respond with, yeah, you know what, that's right. That is right. This is America. You know, we should run it, you know, the way it was intended. So those are the two books that uh, I recommended. And those are my suggestions. And that's the update. And I think I'm out of time. So I think from here we do. Any, any questions? Great. You have questions? Thank you. Will you say thank you? Thank you. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, can you read that one? Run, 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 run. How do we actually stop Diane Feinstein? <laughs> <laughs> well, if she's walking towards you, just say, you know, no, that's. You know, here's the thing about Diane Feinstein. I don't know how many people know this, but Diane Feinstein was in a, uh, she was in a, uh, the supervisor of the county of San Francisco when uh, a fellow supervisor and the mayor of San Francisco were murdered. She was in the next office. When somebody goes through that sort of you know, um, situation, when they, when they have that kind of trauma on their background, I don't know how you can really, expect, you'd have to be an amazing person, I think, to think rationally on the subject. So in my opinion, <laughs> and it's one thing we do in a lot of different subjects, we go to victims and we talk about, hey, you know, you're a victim of whatever, you know, what's your opinion? Well, their opinion's not gonna be rational. Their opinion's gonna be extremely emotional. So people like this, you know, how do you stop this person? By pointing out that they're not qualified to talk on it, that it's pure emotion, they're not using logic, and that there's no way they could have a rational opinion on it considering their past. You mentioned yeah. um, uh, the button thing on the... On bullet button. The bullet button. Yeah, I didn't really get to this. Okay, so real quickly, the bullet button. Okay, so this was produced by Calguns, these computer geeks I was talking about. On this side of the paper, this is a flow chart to see if, if, if your rifle is legal. <laughs> this is the only state in the union that has, any, that has to have some kind of ridiculous flow chart like this. So what, one of the things they came up with is if you look on the other, page, on the other side of the page, and I don't know how many people are familiar with how, a, how a, an AR or any kind of rifle with a detachable magazine works, but the magazine, there's this little guy sticking down at the bottom, and that's where all the ammunition's kept, right? Well, if you press that button, the magazine comes out. Well, in order to work within the law, they came up with a device to where you take the tip of a bullet, which now is a tool, and you push into the little button, and then the magazine can come out. Because now it's not a detachable magazine. Now it's a magazine that requires a tool to come out of the gun. So that's a bullet button. So what ended up happening was um, AR sales and a lot of other semi-automatic rifles, which are you know, some of the most commonly owned uh, rifles in America, they came to a halt in California. After they figured out how to work within the law, and there's more on this, on this, in this handout, um, they came up with this bullet button concept and boom, ARs are off and running again. Um, people are able to buy them, able to protect themselves with them, able to use them for sport and hunting, that sort of thing. So the bullet button is what made ARs legal in California again. It made a lot of detachable magazine firearms legal again. Because like I said, that bullet acts as a tool, so it's no longer a detachable magazine. It's now a magazine that comes off with, with, with a tool. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any question on that? Does that not make sense? Mm -hmm. not, no. Let me paraphrase this question here. Okay. I'll need to read the mic. Um, Regarding the gun bans, why do the government officials not go back to the Constitution and Bill of Rights? You tell me. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, a couple decades ago, there, uh, especially on the left, there kind of came this whole living document philosophy that, you know, one year it means this and the next year it means that. And, and I say if, 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 if it's a document that can mean anything, then it's a document that means nothing. So, I, I can't answer that question. I wish I could. Okay. And then let me read this. It seems to me 
that if Congress wants to take our guns away, why don't they trust us? Why would Congress not trust its citizens? What are your thoughts on that? And then a, a caveat, by the way, the reason Japan did not invade the U.S. was because of individual gun ownership. Yep. There'd, there'd be a gun behind every blade of grass was exactly what the, uh, the I forget who it was, the uh, Yamamoto said. Um, you know, I, I look at guns as, uh, as uh, kind of the ultimate uh, litmus test when it comes to rights. You can tell what a person's view on rights, liberties, and freedoms are going to be um, by how they stand on guns. Because it's kind of the ultimate right, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's trusting your neighbors, it's trusting your, uh, you know, your fellow countrymen, um, you know, with, you know, their, with the right to keep and bear arms. It's kind of, you know, like I said, the ultimate right. Um, you know, the First Amendment, if you say something bad to somebody, their feelings are hurt, you know? But with a gun, when exercised, you're trusting that somebody, you know, is able to do the right thing um, with the ultimate of consequences. So, a lot of times when people say, hey, they're strong on rights and they're strong on liberty and all that other stuff, um, and you start asking them about guns and they go, mm, I don't really want somebody to, mm. you realize how weak they are on, on firearms. Um, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, it, the whole purpose of our, of, of our government, what we were started for, what made us different, was that we were self governed. We're a self governed nation. You know, we're not here to be protected by our government. We're not here to be taken care of by our government. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I think the Second Amendment is the ultimate litmus test when it comes to rights, liberties, and freedom. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, but we got to read it. In the, you write it down? Yes. Did you give it to me? Is this this one? Yeah. List of bills going to pass? Oh, you know what? That's on this piece of paper right here, as a matter of fact. I'll get down to the very bottom. More legislative info on the bills I spoke about. www calnra.com, it's at the very bottom. They actually have all of the, the bills so far that have been, you know, the placeholder bills and the ones that have been written. You can find all the information